uh, silver, when it broke down through 22 for a day back at the end of September, and uh, Comex silver went down to like 12, 12 or 13 bucks. Now, silver's already fallen 11 days in a row. And it's getting really, really oversold. You know, you look at the stock market. What's the stock market up here today? 34%, right? And yeah, Bitcoin's up 300% or whatever. And, and I don't have any doubt that that's... If there was no such thing as Bitcoin, the flows into precious metal would be even greater, right? But now people look at that and think, well, okay, this, you know, this is at least an alternative investment. It's a, specul it's a speculative investment. There's still no doubt about that. Um but nonetheless, that's siphoning off dollars as well. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, Patrick, we live now, nobody has an attention span longer than about 10 minutes. You know, I can sit here and lay out all of this bullish case about gold and the gold miners. You know, my I got this friend of mine I've made named Tavi Costa that works out in Denver at Crescat Capital. And he does all these great charts showing how the mining companies are cranking out free cash flow for the first time, like, in history, it seems. And you got all these great fundamentals. Nobody cares. Why? Well, why do I want to care about holding gold and maybe, you know, in a really good year where the banks play defense, it goes up 20% when I can just buy freaking Tesla, you know, or some other uh, meme stock and make 20% in a day or a week. And so, no, I mean, so it's really hard to fight that prevailing sentiment. You know, no, this notion that nobody needs diversification. Nobody needs safety. Nobody needs a balanced portfolio, man. Just plow it all into that Kathy Woods Arc Fund, you know, and let's make as much fiat as we can. That is still the prevailing sentiment. And that, that is something that, you know, we just keep fighting. People are still stacking gold. A physical demand remains really strong, whether it's through central banks, whether it's, you know, like the citizens of Turkey. I mean, as the lira has been devalued, look at how gold in, in Turkish lira has just been soaring. I mean, it's doing its job there. But, you know, what we all care about is a dollar price, not the Turkish lira price. And I, for now, nobody, I mean, there's just not enough demand for all of it in all its forms, particularly in the futures contracts. It's in the futures markets that the price is discovered, if you will. Okay, the Fed for five years spun this narrative that they were going to draw down their balance sheet, right? Every, oh, yes, we are going to let bonds mature and the balance sheet's going to go back, you know, normalize, normalize. Remember normalize was a big word? Rates were going to normalize too. And I was like, wait, no, you can't. I mean, we're already paying $500 billion a year in interest on the national debt, right? It's $30 trillion in debt, paying $500 billion a year because they've been able to lower the total collective yield, the interest that they have to pay on that's like 1.6%. Okay, well, let's, let's let rates go up to 3.2%. Now you're paying it more than a trillion a year. I mean, the whole thing just spirals that much faster out of control. So this notion that the Fed can ever normalize, they, they've got to keep everything. If you raise rates, that's disinflationary. That's soaking up money. Well, that, the economy, to keep the place spinning, they need as much cash as possible to keep servicing all of this existing debt. And to keep the wealth effect going, of keeping the stock market up, all this kind of stuff. And so we saw this in 2018. The whole thing finally came crashing down. The 10-year note got to three and a quarter percent, and everything seized up. The stock market, the doubt that I'm sorry, the S&P fell 20 percent from late November to Christmas Day in 2018. They had a meeting of the president's working group on capital markets, the plunge protection team, on Christmas Eve. Christmas Day, the markets are closed. December 26th, Dow magically goes back up a thousand points. But that was the moment that the Fed then said, oh, we can't do this. By June of the next year, because it takes them a while, they actually started cutting. Real rates have been falling the entire time over the last three years. Nominal rates have fallen back. And obviously the COVID thing, you know, drove it all the way back to 50 basis points or whatever on the 10 year note. But this idea that they're going to somehow withdraw liquidity, stop adding it, step away from the bond market, let the bond market soak it up. Well, you know, maybe they've created so many, so much reserves what is it, 1.5 trillion in reverse repo ever, or in repo every day? There'd be uh, maybe that will come flooding out to buy 10 year notes. Maybe, for a while, maybe. But this notion that, you know, the Fed's going to control inflation by raising interest rates, again, with as long of a lead time as that takes, I mean, that's just, that's not going to happen. That's, that's the jam that, I mean, if I was Powell and Biden said, uh, hey, Jerry, uh, thinking about going with this gal over here, Brainerd, I'd have gone, yes. Crap, dealt with this. I'm moving to Florida. I'm going to play golf every day. <laughs> I don't want to do any part of this job for another four years. But, you know, the fame and the 
having the microphone at CNBC and all these places, whatever you want, I guess is too much. And so you want to stick on for another four years. It's a real, it's a real jam that we're in. Um, all the stuff they tried to do in the eighties and you know, they can't do today. So, so we'll just, you know, we write it out. We buy the physical metal on the dips, knowing that it's our protection for when those plates all finally stop spinning again. And, uh, I don't know what next year's going to bring, Patrick. we got another election here in the U.S. It's going to get crazy. You know, if you thought 2020 was crazy. Whew. So um, we'll just write it out and uh, understand what's going on. Like I said, all this statistical nonsense that they try to do. Understand the value of my precious metal doesn't change. The price changes in dollar terms, but the value of it, given all that we've talked about, it only goes up every day. So I'm going to keep buying it, and we'll just keep keep riding the storm out, my friend. It was two weeks ago. We're recording this on the third. It was two weeks ago today. All of a sudden, gold slumped from about 1860 down to 1850. Uh, the next following Monday is when uh, Biden announced that Powell was going to be renominated, and you know, and that was here comes another one of those massive red candles, right? So once it you know was pretty clear that this was not the breakout, this is not the breakout you're looking for. You know, we got above 1830, went to 1880. It was like okay, if we now get above 1920, you know. Eh, that didn't happen this time. But then you got to start worrying about how far can this be run to the downside. Then all of a sudden, here comes here comes Omi, my homie, right? Uh, Omicron. And uh, everybody's freaking out. Nobody knows anything about the severity of it yet. And frankly, uh, you know, if you study virology or, you know, and, and the evolution of, of viruses, does the virus, not, not that viruses are, have brains, but as they evolve, they need a host. So typically viruses don't evolve into something more deadly because if it kills off all the hosts, well, then the virus is done, right? So right. typically they evolve into, I mean, look at all the, you know, all the different variants of just regular cold viruses. That's why you don't have a cure for the common cold. Those are coronaviruses too. They typically evolve into something that spreads more, but it's less deadly. But we don't know any of that yet. And everybody's freaking out. Um, and so I, as we, the long answer to your short question uh, it was last Friday in my summary podcast for everybody. I, you know, I do one every day at uh, my site here. Um, I mentioned, okay, how, what's our downside? Let's uh, compare this to what we went through in February and March of last year before the Fed, you know, opened the floodgates. And uh, Comex Silver went down to like 12, 12 or 13 bucks at the low in March of 2020. I'm, again, like you could buy at that. I did. I, you know, one of my companies I work with, uh, has a platform that uh, that you can kind of do that sort of thing, but um, you can't, you know, every place else, you know, is twenty four dollars, you know, twenty one dollars. Nobody could buy it at twelve. Gold went to fourteen forty, I think. I think the day bef on March twentieth, the Friday before Kiwi to Infinity was announced on the twenty third, it was fourteen eighty. All right, so is that what your downside is? If you know we're heading into this fear and shutdown, I don't think so. I don't think that's what the lows are. So the levels I'm watching, first in gold, um, 1760 has been a real important level of support or resistance. Below there, though, there are a series of uh, two different double bottoms on the chart, one from uh, last year and one from this year. Uh, actually, no, they're both from this year. Anyway, 1680 and then 1720. There's two kind of stair-step double bottoms. Below 1760, okay, well, here comes 1720. And if it really gets out of hand, I, I think 1680 is your worst case. 1680 was a uh, base support level for a long time, April to June of last year. So I think that's your downside. If it, I mean, they, you know, if, if things really uh, get wacky before the Fed reverses course. Uh, silver, when it broke down through 22 for a day back at the end of September, uh, if you look at the chart, there's a the one last gap. You know, if you... A lot of people think anytime there's a gap in the chart, eventually it's going to get filled. The one last gap is down about 1950 to 20. Now, silver's already fallen 11 days in a row, and it's getting really, really oversold. So I don't know, you know, absent some huge spike in the dollar, you know, and all this other craziness, you know, in a mini version of February, March of last year. I don't know if we can get all the way down there, but when we drop below 22 back in September, that's what I started thinking is that you might get like a one day plunge down below 20 just to fill that gap in the chart that would be like well i don't want to make it sound like uh oh, this guy just says oh you gotta buy buy the dip and all that stuff but man i can't you get a dip down there um that would probably be a, a if you're aggressive trader or stacker that would i would say that would be something you'd use to your before we continue help us clicking that youtube like button and subscribe now to our channel this shows the algorithm that you valued this information 
and it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin. It went through the roof, to the moon so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, Here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.